gracious, kind, loving Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, we once again approach your throne of grace, mercy, truth, and love, and salvation, and eternal life. Dear Lord, if there's been anything or anyone here on this campground that's been a Sabbath breaker, our conversation, our thoughts, our actions, our motives, our looks, our frowns, anything, Lord, that's offended you and brought a frown upon your face today on your holy Sabbath day. We ask that you would please forgive us, that you would blot it out of your book of record, that you would write pardon against our names, and that you give us a fresh start, Lord, from square one from this point forward. Please help us to do better in the future. We ask and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, good evening, everyone. Good evening, dear sister. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that we are to do all things decently and in what? Uh, that's 1 Corinthians 14, 40. And in 6th Testimony, page 200, paragraph 2, the, the, the prophet says that order is heaven's first what? Law. So I want to piggyback just for a second about the meeting our dear brother and sister had about focus on the family. Just for the record, I want to say that Brother, brother Bridges and Sister Bridges have a system at home. And Brother Bridges washes his wife's clothes. Amen. Amen. And I've been doing it for years. And I hang up her fine washables and everything. Amen. And uh, she does all the kitchen work. She's the kitchen scientist. And my job is to clean the kitchen after she cooks. <laughs> and after I eat. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, sister. So that's, that's our little system at home. She cooks, I clean. And I actually find, well, we actually have a dishwasher, so it's not as bad as it sounds. But before we got that, back in the city, we didn't have one. So I just washed with my hands. And I always found dishwashing to be therapeutic. So I'm just, I'm just letting you know how our system works. Every, every family has their system, right? And that, that's ours. That's ours. So we just try to make things easier for each other. My wife is the YouTube University student. And she's found so many things. She's found things for me to do, right, in the country. Uh, one of the best things she discovered was this, the automatic drip irrigation system for our little mini farm. And I'm telling you, it, it saves so much time and energy. The time, the time. You, you have to go out. Once you have a garden in the country, I know you, those of you who are in the country identify with this. You have to go out in the morning, and you have to go out in the evening. You have to water and so you have to stand there and go plant by plant, crop by crop, seedling by seedling, and water it all. So she went on YouTube because it just was taking up just too much time. And she watched this video about the drip irrigation system. And she said, she said, honey, you can do this. So I watched the video. I said, you know what? I can do this. Remember, I'm a city slicker, so I'm used to calling somebody and having them do it, right? <laughs> so I had to drive about two hours away. It was the only place in the area, in the region, that had the materials that I needed. The, the, the tubing, the hose for the water, and then the actual, actual drip tape itself that you run from the hose down each of the ferrules all the way down the rows that will water each of the, of the uh, rows, and the hydrants, of course, and everything that goes along with it. So it took me not even barely a day to do it. And uh, it wasn't too bad. It's sad, but I'm not going to get into the price, but it has been a dream. Bought a couple of timers. You set the timer. And have mercy. That's it. Don't even have to think about it. And everything is watered thoroughly every day. And I'm telling you, it has been a wonderful time saver. Just a little tidbit there. We have a lot of stuff that we want to share. Um, we actually planned on, in the last year or so, really, we felt impressed to get into a lot more media with our ministry. And this was the next thing we were going to do. We've already done three out of the city's webinars. And we wanted to do... A fourth, and we're going to call it Out of the Cities, the Country Outpost Center, God's Private School. We had planned to do it last year. I know, I'm sure most of you know that Elder Mason passed away December of uh, 2017, and uh, we were actually at his funeral at Oakwood University. Well, actually, they buried him at Oakwood, and we were at the, the uh, grave site. And at the graveside, watching them getting ready to put him in the ground, and my phone rings, and it's my mother from Cali telling me that my dad died. So my father passed away the same day Brother Mason was being buried. So that was a shock. So we packed up and flew to California the very next morning. 
So we had kind of a hangover, of course, from that. And then about eight months, nine months after that, my wife's mother died in, in L.A. So it's been uh, it's been challenging, but God is faithful. God is faithful. So we've kind of had a kind of a hangover from all that. But we're now just starting to get our bearings. So what I want to do tonight also just to continue. So we plan on doing a lot more media. We're going to get into the kitchen and we're going to get into the garden. And we're going to, we have a lot of things, just basic country living instructions. And remember, we target our audience to the people that are still in the city. And we're trying to, especially in terms of the brothers, because the brothers are very hesitant and reluctant because they have to do something they've probably never done before, and that's work and work hard. It's a whole different way of life. I don't mean that to be condescending. It's reality, because I was like that. I've spent years working out in the gym and playing basketball and baseball and all that stuff, football, but it's not the same as having to go out and physically exert energy every single day. It is not the same. You use different muscle groups every day. So there are many times you don't want to get up, but you got to get up. Because you got to get the work done. So we're going to get into all the different tools that are involved, the weed whackers, the tractors, the mowers. We're going to get into all that stuff uh, segment by segment and video by video and just try to educate the brothers and sisters. Amen. My wife's going to get into all the natural stuff, too. So that's our plan coming up. But the Lord has had us really busy. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to do a 30 minute presentation on God's uh, 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 private school. Excuse me. It's part two, basically, from last night. Then we're going to do maybe a 20-minute or so Q&A. I'm going to ask you to please kind of tailor your questions toward the out-of-the-cities, country living issues. Because when we start getting into prophecy and doctrine and different things, it really is really going to keep the time going over. It starts to kind of spill over. So I'm going to ask, because this is a, a practical skills camp out, that we keep our questions geared toward country living. Amen. And then after that, I'm going to attempt to give my little personal testimony. It's rather dynamic, but I want somebody to remind me. Maybe I can give a young person a job for me. Who's young? <laughs> Praise the Lord. My help me. Remind me to end the, the uh, who? Who's raising their hand? Somebody young? Okay, my sister here, praise the Lord. Okay, I want you to do me a favor. When I, before I get to the end, don't let me forget, I mentioned last night how I did something back in January this year that told the Lord, okay, I can use you, really, really use you now. And so he put us in full-time self-supporting ministry, full-time. So I want you to remind me to give that testimony because I know it's going to bless a lot of people in here Amen. regarding working for the world. It's, it's very important. It's a sensitive issue. It needs to be discussed because God has a plan for his people. We talked about God's permissive will this morning. God had a plan, but circumstances have changed. Everybody's in the cities and everybody's working to make a living and they feed their families. But that wasn't God's original plan. So God's trying to get us back to his original plan, which is working full time for who? For the master. And it's all about faith. Faith. Faith is the substance of things what? The evidence of things not seen, the substance of things. I'm sorry. Let me read. Let me start over. Hey, <laughs> forgive me, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Tongue tied. Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the evidence of things. Thank you, sister. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. The mind, the mind, the mind. A lot of scriptures up here. Amen. So, um, why don't we go ahead and get started? So this is God's private school. You see that little girl up there? Let me go back. This might not seem like it to you, but she's in school. Now, she's not in the classroom. She's not in the classroom. Actually, this is her classroom. Let, let, me, let me correct that. This is her classroom. The prophet brings out the fact that it wasn't God's plan for students to sit in the class for six, seven, eight hours a day with the windows closed up. Recon now, they didn't have reconditioned air the way we do now in her day, but reconditioned air, that wasn't God's plan. No sunshine, no fresh air, no exercise hardly at all. You can't keep the eight laws of health sitting in a classroom all day. And then after the regular, traditional, conventional school is over, then you have the, what is it, when they go over somewhere else until their parents get off work and pick them up? It's been a while for me. Daycare or, or an annex or whatever they call it, yes. 
after school program. That's what I'm talking about. So you add that on, a lot of times kids are at school 10, 11, sometimes 12 hours a day. Is that God's plan? No. No. He, can, he, he can't teach them when they're there. The system can teach them, but God teaches them when they're there, when they're there. And I gave the story this morning about the, the uh, backboard, basketball backboard on the grass. The earth breathes, but not only does the earth not breathe when you're in a, in a concrete classroom, the children can't breathe either. So that's the point. Just to reiterate a few slides to recall where we were last night, I think the, the uh, projector might be a little bit higher than it needs to be. But we'll let somebody work on that. We have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of what? Medical missionary work. Every member of what church? The Seventh-day Adventist church. So again, I'm not a genius, but that tells me, that tells me that if you're not a medical missionary doing some type of medical missionary work, are you really a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Because she says every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. So we need to all learn how to do a, a charcoal and poultice, cabbage wrap, something. Just start off at ground zero. Start treating people. But like I said yesterday, the first thing we need to do is pray for people when they're sick. Come to them and pray with them. That will have a profound effect on people. Just the fact that you care. I wish to tell you that there soon there will be no work done in ministerial lines but medical missionary work. Is that the projector? Thank you. Thank you, Sister Bridges. Just need it down a little, but not too low because the people in the back won't be able to see. <clears throat> so at some point, that's all we're going to be doing. But remember, remember last night, we're going to see this in a minute. Remember, the medical missionary work has to be connected to what? The gospel. So if all we're doing is medical missionary work, what that really says is the medical missionary work, we're going to be doing the true, the true medical missionary work attached to the gospel, right? Thank you, sister. What is true medical missionary work? That? That? No. What about that? No. That? No. The work of the true medical missionary is largely what? Spiritual work. So all those examples aren't pointing people to who? To Christ. If you're not pointing them to Christ in terms of the medical healing you're doing, it's not true medical missionary work. That's very important to know. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Just want to try to just do a brief review. So Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. Sister White says the writer of the gospel that bears his name was a medical missionary. So he combined his medical work with his gospel work. The two have to always exist together. Always. Never to be separated. Okay, we're going to skip through. It's going to get a few points here. The medical missionary work should be a part of the work of what? How many? Every church in our land. Every church, including Madoc. Disconnected from the church, it would soon become a strange medley of disorganized atoms. They have to work together. In new fields, no work is so successful as medical missionary work. So the Lord sends you to Siberia or Romania or somewhere. And the first thing you start doing is going to the Bible, and that's all? No, the first thing you start doing is talking to people about how they feel. How do you feel? Is anybody sick in here? Can I pray for somebody who has an illness or a condition or an affliction? They will flock to you, and then you start going through this. And you show them where Jesus healed. And there's many examples, of course, in the Bible. Isaiah 38 comes to mind with his poultice that he got, right, his fig poultice. So the medical missionary work is God's way to get to people's hearts and gain entrance to Jesus. Amen. Again and again, I have been instructed that the medical missionary work is to bear the same relation to the work of the third angel's message that the arm and hand bear to the body. So it is the right hand and the right arm of the body, the body of truth, the body of the gospel. It's the right arm. So we talked about last, last night, if there's a right arm, there has to be a left arm. There has to be some balance, correct? The title of last night's message was the left arm of the body. Let me keep going. Let me read this right quick. The right hand is used to open doors through which the body may find entrance. This is the part the medical missionary work is to act. It is to largely prepare the way for the reception of the truth for this time. A body without hands is what? Useless. Useless. Okay, let's go. Let's go through this. 
So the first thing we should do when we start talking to somebody about health, I found personally, and so is my wife, the first question you want to ask people usually is, do you drink water? You'd be amazed how many things can be taken care of or remedied just by drinking your proper amount of water every day. Half your body weight in ounces. That's what you tell people, right? I know there's some medical missionaries here. Let me skip through. We went through this last night. I wish to speak about the relation existing between the medical missionary work and the gospel ministry. It has been presented to me. Who presented it to her? First of all, God did. That every department of the work is to be united in one great whole. Unity. Jesus prayed for unity in John 17. Read John 17 and read it carefully. Carefully. A lot of meat in there. The work of God is to prepare a people to stand before the Son of Man at his coming. And this work should be a what? A unit. The work that is to fit a people to stand firm in the last great day must not be a divided work. So this is the model. The head is Jesus Christ. The body is the gospel ministry, of course. And the right arm is a medical missionary work. In 1844, a little over a generation after the New Testament church has spent 1,260 years being nourished in the wilderness with the great Protestant Reformation, right? That was the nourishment she received, amen? The Lord brought forth a body he would use to finish the work and close the gospel. He made this body complete by adding appendages, specifically arms and feet. And we went through this, of course, last night. So we have... The cross, the body. Jesus is the head. The body, of course, is the gospel, the, the church, the truth. Now, if there's any confusion here, I know we have some Bible students here. What is that? Who put that there, first of all? Pilate, that's right, amen. And what does it say in Latin? Yes, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the... Okay, so I want to make sure that's clear, okay? Praise God. So we, we read in Isaiah 52, 7. We also read in Hebrews 10 that the feet represent, also Ephesians 6, that the feet represent publishing and also preaching, correct? The right arm, I'm going to come back to that. The right arm is the health reform message, and the left arm is teaching, because health reform and teaching should never be separated, always together. So if you're teaching health, you're teaching everything else, the gospel too, right? They have to go together. So health reform and teaching are inextricably intertwined how? Together, together. Now, this is the statement that we read last night that is very, very powerful. If you didn't read it, if you weren't here last night, please pay attention. She says, now as never before, we need to do what? Understand. How do you understand? By being where? In the most holy place. We need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. Did you get the lesson? Now remember, remember the image in the beginning of the little girl running through the countryside outdoors. That's a big clue for you. Huge clue. We're talking about God's system of education. So healing the sick and teaching the gospel are an inseparable relationship. So there's a city and there's a country. Well, we, what do we start off when we come to people about their health? We start off with the eight laws of health, correct? The eight laws of health are suppressed in the city, but the eight laws of health are magnified in the country. Amen. Magnified. By the way, that, that's me right there. That's me. Amen. For the young people, right? So there's a problem with keeping the eight laws here. And from where we're from, Los Angeles now, you know that the air isn't the, the high healthiest. The quality is not very good. And that's true in most large cities, correct? So is the water. Disease, this is uh, Ministry of Healing 127. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. That's the definition of disease. So when you cough, your body's telling you, well, I need to take some medicine. Is that what your body's telling you so I can stop coughing? Is that what you should do? No, your body's telling you that you're doing something to me that you need to stop doing. So I'm, it's a cry for help. It's a purging that's taking place. Sneezing as well. So you got to identify these, these different symptoms. They're not really symptoms, but we have to get to the cause. The cause. We talked about that last night as well, correct? As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse cause less shall not come, correct? 
Proverbs 26, 2. So here are the eight laws. Again, Ministry of Healing 127. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, that's temperance, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. These are the what? True remedy. You mean NyQuil and, and Robitussin and all those things? That's not true? These are the true remedies. Every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. It is essential, that means necessary, both to understand the principles involved in the treatment of the sick and to have a practical training that will enable one rightly to use this knowledge. And that's what God wants us to know, because that's the work he wants us to do. So the eight laws of health, we call it God's plan. It's an acronym. Godly trust, G. Open air, O. Daily exercise, D. Sunlight, S. Not sunshine, sunlight. There is a difference. Proper rest, P. Lots of water, L. Always temperate, A. And nutrition, N. So there's a lot of them out there. I'm sure you've all heard of uh, what is it, New Start, there are a few other ones, but we like God's plan because the godly trust is first. It's on top. So that's why we appreciate God's. I'm not, con again, condemning or anything, but we like godly trust because godly trust comes first. Then everything after that comes after. Amen? So all the eight laws are found right there in the Bible, in the first two chapters of the Bible. Thy hands have fashioned me, it made me, give me what? Understanding and I shall keep thy commandments. But you can't keep his commandments unless you're where? In the most holy place. Amen. So there are eight doctors that make house calls. We call them the eight doctors. And these eight doctors are very affordable. I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time. But those are the eight doctors. Godly trust, open air, daily exercise, sunshine or sunlight. Should be sunlight. Proper rest, lots of water, always temperate nutrition. Let me ask you a question. Are those affordable? I think most of us can afford these doctors. You see, that's God's point. Amen. The gospel is free, so health should be free too. Amen. 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 We went through this with Loma Linda in the Ellen White Hospital in downtown L.A. That's not God's plan. We went through Madison College last night. The School of Madison not only educates in the knowledge of the scriptures, but it gives a practical training that fits the student to go forth as a self-supporting missionary to the field to which he is called. I'm going to read this because this is important. We're going to lay a foundation. In his student days, he is taught how to build simply and substantially, how to cultivate the land and care for the injured medical missionary. This training for medical missionary work is one of the grandest objects for which any school can be established. The time is soon coming when God's people, because of persecution, National Sunday Law, will be scattered in many countries. Those who have received an all-around education will have the advantage where they are. And those of you who have been here all week, everything that's been taught and promoted here all week from up here and over there, everything is part of the education we need to have a great advantage, not only for ourselves, but of course to help other people. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. In our sanitariums, the sick are to be healed and they are to receive a knowledge of right methods of living. You are making a right move in establishing a sanitarium on the large tract of land you purchased for the Madison School. The building may be simple, yet perfect in all its arrangements. Let it be a model that others may copy. The Madison School is our template. It's our template. So our country homes need to be mini Madisons, right? We bought this out last night. A mini Madison. Now this is, I got this going finally. This is our property in Tennessee. It's 40 acres. That's a drone shot. A student there bought a drone that day. And this is a drone shot of the school that we were giving. I think this is either right before the school started or right after. But this is our property. That's our land over here, all the way down there. That's the house there. That's my 40, 20 by 50 foot shop. And we're establishing a country outpost center here. This is right in the middle of, we call it South Middle Tennessee. It's a great blessing, and the Lord put us somewhere we weren't even looking over there in that area at all. And by a miraculous set of circumstances, that's where God put us. 
And remember I talked to you last night about what direction the Lord wanted me to put the chairs for the school. You remember that? And my plan was to face them this way. I wanted to face the chairs this way so the teacher could be here, the farmer, and the students could be looking this way, but it would be toward the house. But the Lord told me after I set them all up, no, I want you to take the chairs and turn them around. They need to face the other way. I said, okay, Lord. So I turned the chairs around. All they could see behind the instructor was grass and trees, land. These trees are 150 foot high, and they, they seal in, they border our entire property. We feel like we're, we're very secure up there. People come up there, workers and contractors, et cetera. They get up there and they say, well, how did you find this place? The Lord did it. The Lord did it. So they were facing this way. And that brother, after three days, said, I understand now. I get it. Amen. So the need and necessity for country outpost centers, we touched on this last night. The definition of outpost, of course, a small military camp or position at some distance from the main force used especially as a guard against surprise attack. Two, and this again, you can find this anywhere online. A remote part of a country or empire, something regarded as an isolated or remote branch of something. A small town in a place that is far away from other towns or cities. So we call the outpost center a little slice or a little piece of heaven because that's what it is. All of heaven's principles are inculcated and involved in the country outpost center. It's a place to win people. Not just to heal people, mind, body, and soul. Are you with me? All right. Repeatedly, the Lord has instructed us that we are to work the cities from what? Outpost centers. In these cities, we are to have houses of worship, that's preaching, as memorials for God, but institutions for the publication, publishing of our literature, for the healing of the sick, and for the training or teaching of workers are to be established outside the cities. And we went to the Bible, we saw where, well, let me read this too. Again, just repeating, cities are to be worked from outposts. So this is God's plan here. Jesus, of course, included all four of these components in his work. So we're to do the same. Teaching, preaching, healing, and publishing. You can go to Matthew 4 and see that for yourself. That's just what he did. Jesus, Jesus complied, complied, I should be, compi no, no. Jesus complied to his own education system. That's what he taught in Eden, and that's what he carried out when he came down on earth and did his three-and-a-half-year ministry. He followed his own plan. Can you say amen? Amen. The system of education instituted, let's get this real good here. Let's get this. Let's get this. The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a what? Model, a model for man throughout all after time. So not only during our time on earth, but also when? After we leave this place. God does not change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. That's God's plan. So he says, she says, as an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. Now, please get this lesson, please. The Garden of Eden was the what? Schoolroom. Nature was the what? Lesson book. The creator himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the what? Students. That is God's blueprint for education. If you have your, your phone, take a picture or write down the, the whoo, Lord, help me. Write down the, the reference. Education, page 20. So that's God's blueprint right there. If you have any questions, that is true education. That is true education. Agriculture, she says, and we're going to see this in a second, agriculture should always be connected with the schools, always, without fail. If you have a school, you got to have a garden. No garden, it's not true education. Are you with me? Okay. The system of education established in Eden centered in what? The family. Adam was the son of God. And it was from their father that the children of the highest received instruction. Theirs, in the truest sense, was a family school. Amen. Amen to that. In the divine plan of education, God's plan, true education, as adapted to humanity's condition after the fall, Christ stands as the representative of the father, the connecting link between God and the fallen race. He ordained that men and women should be his representatives. The family was the school, the parents were the teachers. Mm. 
Mm, are you seeing this? So do you see how important homeschooling is? Homeschool. That way God is in control because you're following the Lord, right? Yes. Let's go. The education centering in the family was that which prevailed in the days of the patriarchs. The people who were under God's direction still pursued the plan of life that he had appointed when? In the beginning. Now, listen carefully, please. Get this lesson again. She says, those who departed from God did what? Built for themselves cities and congregating in them gloried in their one splendor, two luxury and three vice. Now, let's see the flip side of that. But the families who held fast to God's principles lived among the fields and hills. They were tillers of the soil and keepers of flocks and herds. In this free Independent life. Free? You mean you're not free in the city? I think not. With its opportunities for work and study and meditation, they learned of God and taught their children of his works and ways. Praise the Lord, I say on that. Praise the Lord. Are we all getting this? Praise God. This was the method of education that God desired, desired to establish in Israel. That was his plan for ancient Israel. But they rebelled. They rebelled. But he wants to establish it now for antitypical Israel. Amen. I'm going to skip that. Let's go here. We know this, this quote, right? One manuscript released, 228 paragraph 2. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. Now, I mentioned last night, these six components should be involved on some level in your country home. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, and food factories. What does the word hygienic mean? Conducive to maintaining health and preventing disease, especially by being clean and sanitary. You mean that plant-based diet that we had out there for lunch, that delicious repast, will keep me from getting sick? Is that what she's saying? Mm. All right. It is God's design that our sanitarium shall act an important part in giving the message of Christ's soon coming to those in the highways and byways. Hmm. Sanitariums. Is there something that's inherent in a sanitarium that people need to see that does that? We're going to see. The sanitariums that shall be established are to be God's memorials. Agencies in the conversion of many souls. A sanitarium is going to do that? Hmm. Let's go a little further. Our sanitariums have been established for the purpose of preparing a people for the second coming of our Lord and Savior. The sanitarium. So I ask again, what, what is it in the sanitarium that does that? Must be something, correct? The sanitarium. It's made for what? To lead people to Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. Not just for bathing, not just for, for a uh, hydrotherapy but, or treatment, but it's to lead people to Jesus. Well, how does it do that? Number one, it's designed to get people well, number one. Number two, it's to teach them how to stay well. Are you with me? Number three, is to teach them to teach others how to get well and stay well. And number four, they duplicate the process. They in turn go and they set up their own what? Home sanitarium. Can you say amen? That's God's method of multiplicity. You teach one, they teach somebody else. Is that simple? God's plan is always simple. It's always simple. Let's see. And I want to skip that. So Battle Creek Sanitarium. Look at that. Battle Creek, Michigan. My first question to you is, now we know who established this, right? John Harvey Kellogg. We all know that, right? My first question is, is that a big place? It's relatively large, isn't it? Relatively large, I would say. It's big. Even on standards back then, we're talking about the late 1800s. Cornflakes, John Harvey Kellogg, correct? That's how we identify him, right? Among other cereals that we shouldn't be eating, but that's another study for another day. What's that? That's fire, huh? What's burning? 
Mm. February 18th, 1902. That's after, the morning after. Smoldering, right? The Lord, what's that word? Permitted, permitted fire to consume the principal buildings of the Review and Herald and the sanitarium and thus remove the greatest objection urged against moving out of Battle Creek. It was his design that instead of rebuilding the one large sanitarium, our people should make plants in several places. Did you get the lesson? So Brother Kellogg was very, very rebellious, and he was determined to rebuild it even bigger. This time it's not going to burn down. That's what he said, even though God is the one that allowed it to burn, right? So she says, no, Brother, Brother Harvey or John Harvey, you have a mega sanitarium. That's not God's plan. God wants plants in several places. These, what's that word? Smaller sanitariums should have been established where land could be secured for agricultural purposes. It is, what does that say? God's plan that agriculture shall be connected with the work of our sanitariums and schools. Our youth need to need, need the education, excuse me, to be gained from this line of work. It is well, and more than well, it is essential that efforts be made to carry out the Lord's plan in this respect. So smaller sanitariums, or, or she's talking about home, home sanitariums, or smaller sanitariums in the city that you don't purchase a building for, but that you rent, where you come in and work and, and treat the people and get back out. I'm going to read that in a second. So is Battle Creek our model? No. Never, never build mammoth sanitariums. Is that clear? Let these institutions be what? Small, small, and let there be more of them dotted all over the countryside, right? Home sanitariums. That the work of winning souls to Christ may be accomplished. That's what they're for, to bring people to who? To Jesus, to Jesus. It may often be necessary to start sanitarium work in the city, but never build a sanitarium in a city. Rent a building and keep looking for a suitable place out of the city. The sick are to be reached not by massive buildings, but by the establishment of many small sanitariums, and the word many there, again, which are to be as lights shining in a dark place, jets of light all over the, all over the world. Amen? Because, brother, sister, God's not into display and pump. That's not his, that's not his plan. That's why he has a problem with Loma Linda. I'm, gonna, I'm just calling it like it is. It's display, and that's not, God's not in that. Does God love them? Yes. Does he want to save them? Absolutely. But they've gone the wrong way. But if he saved Lot, he can save them too. Amen? Amen. She says, those who are engaged in this work are to reflect the sunlight of Christ's faith. And we, we, we have many friends that attend church at Loma Linda, live in Loma Linda. We, we're, we're, we understand what's going on there. Trust me. But they love Jesus. By sanitarium work properly conducted, you mean sometimes there's sanitarium work that's improperly conducted? Is there a reason why she put that there? I think so. The influence of true Pure religion will be extended to many souls. You see, these days, and I mentioned this last night, there are many health medical institutions and health institutions in our ranks that are training people for work at the worldly institutions, worldly hospitals. They're not training them to go out and be medical missionaries or be missionaries in general. They're not being trained for They're being trained to make money. That certainly is not God's plan. This is a flyer from way back then that they have for Battle Creek. I'm going to get a little closer and read some of this to you. I know you can't see it. Are you in search of health? Where can you find it? Is it in a warm or cold climate? The Battle Creek Sanitarium provides both. Under skillful and wise direction, patients are allowed to enjoy the keen, cool, crisp, oxygen-laden air of midwinter, combined with highly nourishing, easily digestible foods, massage, electricity, baths, and other sanitarium methods. We're going to go to the next one. Oh, no, here we go, right here. 200 trained nurses. Is that God's plan? No, that's not God's plan. That's, that's a blow-up of the one I just read. 200 nurses. That's not God's plan. God's not into the large and mighty. He's large and mighty. Amen? I'm going to skip through these. A mecca for... These, these are actual flyers for Battle Creek. 
a mecca for health seekers, over 1,000 different curative baths and treatments, renowned diet system, reducing and fattening diet, scientifically regulated, 33 specializing physicians, 300 trained nurses. Is that, is that God's plan? It isn't. And you know, you know, I think we're going to see this in a minute. You know that the prophet counsels that only husbands and wives are to start sanitariums. Only husbands and wives. Now, you can have single people come and work with you in your sanitarium, but they're supposed to be actually established by married couples. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. It's about, it's about Christian protocol. I'm a male, so I can't treat a female. Are you with me? My wife's a female, so she can't treat a male. Are you with me? Christian protocol. We got to do it right. That's God's way. Amen? Amen. I think you understand what I'm talking about. Let me skip through this. Let me go. Okay, so we're talking about Moses now. Okay. God transferred Moses from the courts of where? Luxury. Was Egypt a luxurious place? Yes. Egypt represents sin and worldliness, where his every wish was gratified to a more what? Private school. So if God transferred him to a private school, what kind of school was he in to begin with? A public school. Public school. So his every wish was gratified. Gratified means satisfied, but in a sensual uh, uh, context. Here the Lord could what? Commune with Moses. So God wanted to commune with him, not the other way around. And we read this in Exodus 25, verse 22 where God was giving them instructions on building the sanctuary and in the most holy place above the mercy seat, he said he'd meet Moses there and commune with him. Not Moses going to commune with him. Do you love that? Jesus wants to commune with us. And so, what's that word? Educate him that he would obtain a knowledge of the hardships, trials, and perils of the wilderness. Do we need those components? Yes. I'm watching the time. He gave him, a, him sheep to care for that he might become qualified to be the shepherd of God's people. He was in training, 40 years of school. God saw that the experience Moses would gain while minding sheep would qualify him to be the leader of his people. Let's keep going. During the 40 years in which Moses was engaged in pastoral work, pastoral work in the wilderness, pastoral work? Is that what I just read? Are we getting this? Mm. This is rich. It's rich. And I've read it a thousand times. It's rich every time. He was obtaining a knowledge of who? God. It was while he was following this lowly calling that the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So he revealed himself to him once he was ready to see him, right? Let this lesson be carefully studied. Before God could talk with Moses, he educated him in the mountains among the sheepfolds. Exiled from the courts of Egypt and from the temptations of city life, Moses held communion with God. For 40 years, God tested and disciplined him, preparing him for his important work. For 40 years, Moses dwelt in the wilderness, receiving from God an education that made him a wise, tender, humble man. Can you say amen? When this time was ended, his self-confidence was gone. He was meek and lowly. Who else is meek and lowly? Jesus. Jesus. Read Matthew 28 verses, no, Matthew 11 verses 28 through 30. The, low and meekly, the lowly and meek Jesus, right? So divested of self that God could communicate to him his will in regard to the people he had chosen and whom he designed to educate and discipline in their wilderness life, while he was preparing for them a home in the land of Canaan. And that's our preparation now. True education prepares us for the heavenly Canaan. Amen. Especially our kids. Especially. Moses had been learning much that he must what? Unlearn. The influences that had surrounded him in Egypt. The love of his foster mother. His own high position as the king's grandson. The dissipation on every hand. The refinement, the subtlety, and the mysticism of a false religion the splendor of idolatrous worship, the solemn grandeur of architecture, all of these things exist in the big cities right now, all of them, right there in Toronto. And I don't want to step on any toes, but also, what is it, Bram Brampton? 
Breath, same, same thing. But I got news for you. We learned this the other day. It exists even in a little town like Mad- Madoc because it's still a city. It's still a city. Don't live downtown. Get out of downtown. Even if it's a little town square, you need to be away from those people because they're not living godly. It's not a condemnation. It's God's plan. Come in and teach them and seek them, but then get back out. If it's three million people, eight million people, or a thousand people, a thousand is still too many. It's still too many. All had left deep impressions upon his developing mind. So he was young, right? Developing mind. And had molded to some extent his habits and what? Character. It's all about character. One, time. Two, change of surroundings. And three, communion with God could what? Remove these impressions. So God has a system in place to take all that away. All this can take, be taken away if you're in the right place for a period of time and you're talking to God. Can you say amen? That's right. So we talked about this a little bit last night, the outpost center. So you have workers that are there starting with the owners, right? The husband and wife or whoever actually owns the property. They are consecrated and self-sacrificing. They have to be that. You bring in guests from the city, bring them into your home, and you teach them the principles of God, starting with health reform. Health reform. So it's a country training base, your home, and a city mission training base. Your home is not just, just a home. Your home, first of all, is God's home, but it's also a God for all the other sheep. I mean, a home for all the other sheep. Excuse me. Not just for you and your family. Abraham. God called Abraham to be a what? Teacher of his word, just to reiterate what I just said. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household and the principles of God's law. And you can read that in Genesis 18, verse 19. God said, for I know him, for he will command his children and his household after him to keep the ways of the Lord. So there's a difference between his biological children and his household, right? Let's prove that. She says, and that which gave power to Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than how many? A thousand souls, many of them heads of families, and not a few but newly converted from heathenism. So his home was not just his home. It was a training ground. And we're not going to have time, but in Genesis 14, when his nephew Lot was stuck in in Sodom, when it was besieged and at war by these five other heathen nations, and he had to go and rescue Lot, the Bible says that he brought with him 318 soldiers born in his house. Born in his household. Abraham. Abraham was following God's blueprint. It's simple. We don't even need the spirit of prophecy to prove that. It's right there in the Bible. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to skip this. Enoch was in what? And at Venice. Hmm. He made his abode, did not make his abode with the wicked. He did not locate in Sodom thinking to save Sodom like Lot did. I'm going to come down here. He saw and understood something of the leprosy of sin. After proclaiming his message, he, what is that word? He always took back with him to his place of retirement some who had received the warning. Some of these became overcomers and died before the flood. Can you say amen? But that's what Nehemiah, that's God's plan right there in action. In action. As God's commandment keeping people, we must leave the cities. As did Enoch We must work in the cities, but not dwell in them. Not dwell in them. I'm going to have to wind this down and get to the Q&A. I'm going to go through this real quick, because many people ask us, where should we live? How far should we live from the city? Now, there's no mile number that Sister White gives at all, the Bible either. There's no specific number, 50 miles, 100. People have their theories, but it's not given. But there's a principle. You want to be far enough away where you're not affected by the city influence, but you want to be not too far away where you can go work the city. That's the principle. So if you live a thousand miles from Toronto, it's going to be kind of hard to work Toronto. Do you agree? But you're just far enough where you can get there, pass out literature, visit the sick, work the city, and then go back to your country home, maybe 150, 200 miles away. And again, I'm not giving you a number. That's just how far it has to be for both those principles. We live an hour and 15 minutes or so from the next largest city, which is Nashville. It's just far enough, just far enough. And believe me, the people there, 
where we not, they're not even considering you out there way out yonder. They're not even thinking about it. All they're concerned about is what's happening in that city. And when the, when the uh, crisis comes, all they're going to be concerned about is where do I find food in this city where I live. But they're not going to be able to leave anyway. That's another study, too. So Enoch walked with God but didn't live in the midst of any city. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them even if they had lived in a place some distance away from the city. Did you get the lesson? I'm going to go ahead and close out. We have to get to this Q&A because it's starting to wind down. The time's going. It's 8 o'clock. How do we feel? Feel good? Praise God. I'm going to close and pray, and then we're going to have the Q&A. Is that all right? Okay. I'm trying to keep my, my covenant with the, with the committee. Amen. All those that are able, please kneel with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the brief time we spent studying your word, Lord, and your precious message. I pray that hearts were touched and pricked tonight. Lord, we all need to be pricked at some point. Even those of us who have been in the message for a while, a lot of times we need encouragement, Lord, and uplifting and upbuilding. I pray, Lord, that they would all, all those who were touched tonight, would move forward in faith and that they would trust in thee to lead them where you want them to go. You have a place for them. You have an address for them, Lord. If they're willing, we know, Lord, by faith and promise that you want to put them where you need them to do the work you need to be done. Not where they want to go, but they need to follow you whithersoever you say to go. We pray that you would please bless the next uh, segment as we have our little Q&A. Father, you know, I don't know it all, but you do. So I'm leaning on you for counsel. I'm leaning on you for answers. We thank and love you in Jesus' name. Amen.